Thank you, Cindy. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. We are excited to share with you today a lot of great information in this next hour that we think will be valuable to you and your business. I will get us started and walk you through some of the key findings of our recent rele recently released 2024 cost to originate study. I will touch on the shifting mortgage landscape and the impact it has on today's production costs. We'll also talk about some of the trends we are seeing across the industry related to the use of technology and its impact on savings, cycle time, and the revenues. And then Jody will delve into specific digital strategies that can help to reduce cost and create opportunities for your organizations. She will also share with you some of the resources to help you get there. Uh, Judy and I will co-pilot this session and hopefully by the end of this hour, you can walk away with uh, at least a few takeaways that could be helpful to you and, as I said, your business. Uh, let's get to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to begin with our discussion with today's landscape on the cost to originate. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, let's start our overview with a quick assessment of loan production volume and lenders' financials. As you can see on this chart, that plots historical trend of quarterly origination, so mortgage origination data, the grade bars, and prolonged cost and revenue of retail only lenders sourced from the Mortgage Bankers Association quarterly performance report. The revenues are the green lines that you see in plotted across, and the blue lines, of course, represent the cost or expenses in this instance. Uh, the origination cost per loan has been on the upward trajectory since 2008, since the Great Recession, essentially. Um, you know, when we did our initial study, uh, one of the major items that we noted in that particular study, why the costs have increased, uh, was related to compliance costs. But I mean, it definitely have changed, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. But for now, just uh, note that there is an, a ramp up in cost. But for a bit there, during the time of historic low interest rates and refi boom observed back in 2009 through 2021, lenders experienced some relief. Uh, was caused declining or flattening for many mortgage originators. But as the interest rates started to go up and the origination volume declined, the cost started to go up back up uh, uh, again. Uh, in fact, a comparison of our own calculation of per loan production cost between uh, fourth quarter of 2020. Um, the previous time we ran the similar study and the Q3 of 2023 shows that origination costs have increased by $3,000 per loan in the past three years. It's a 35% increase. Granted, during that time, the market conditions were a bit different than they are today. But it's not just the cost that present the challenge in today's environment. The revenues are down as well. Um, specifically, uh, they're down 11% from the last time we ran the study. Um, the primary to secondary spread that many institutions were able to enjoy um, back when uh, the rates were low are no longer there. The fierce competition today made the rate spreads paper thin. And as a result of all that, many retail lenders operate today at a loss. Next slide, please. On this slide, uh, I want to take a deeper dive into specific functions and factors driving the cost ramp ups uh, to learn the whys behind the data that we uh, were we're seeing um, uh, during our analysis of cost uh, research. As a part of this research, we conducted a series of interviews with lenders and. And of course, we also did a survey of loan officers, underwriters, as well as folks in loan production management. The results show that when it comes to operational functions, most know that cost increased across the entire spectrum of origination functions. Many lending institutions also report administration, operations, digital tools, and customer support as having more significant cost increases than any other categories. When it comes to the key reasons driving the ramp ups, these include inflation, elevated inflation has had a significant impact on lenders' production costs. 
lending institution particularly mentioned labor, payroll expenses, rent tops, um, as well as increases in vendor and technology costs and fees. Um, today's purchase dominated production mix is yet another reason driving, driving the cost upward. Purchase dominated production mix tends to be more time consuming, more labor intensive, and of course, a more error prone and therefore more expensive. Let's also note that uh, and not forget about the access capacity occur occurring during the periods of low loan production um, volume or low economies of scale. You might recall seeing the costs spiking, especially high in periods where volume drop um, or more pronounced. Um, the allocation of cost across few loans tend to drive cost upwards. Yet another factor that is important to uh, point out is a ramp up in technology spend. Our conservative estimate is that technology related expenses per loan have risen from 2% to 4% in the past years, three years specifically. Uh, it is definitely way more for those who are more um, technology and uh, technologically advanced. But at the end of the day, digital tools drive efficiency benefits, and many lenders note that this spend is. Uh, unavoidable and necessary. But speaking of efficiencies, let's take a closer look at Q3 2023 cost per loan distribution on this next slide. Uh, this is the snapshot uh, of total market production cost per loan benchmarks for third quarter of 2023. The sample consists of 203 lenders that we are able to source from um, MBF Iraq. We took uh, those 203 lenders and broke them up into four quartiles based on the total cost per loan. What we are showing here are the first quartile average, those top performers or the top 25 of lenders with lowest cost within the sample of lenders, and the first quartile average, those bottom performers or the bottom 25% of lenders with higher cost. As you can see on this slide, the average annual market cost to originate a mortgage in Q3 2023 was 11,600. For the top 25% most efficient originators, the average pro cost was nearly half that $6,900 and nearly two and a half times, more specifically 2.4 times, less than the bottom 25 performers. So we are comparing 6,900 for the top uh, performers and the 16,500 for the bottom performers here. Note that we also included institution breakout by size. As we understand that size often defines the strategy and level of efficiencies lenders can achieve um, given their capacity. Institution size is often noted as a leading characteristic driving the loan production cost differences. However, um, factors such as production of uh, institution type, whether you're an independent mortgage banks or a depository also makes a difference. Uh, also, a mix of refinance versus purchase loans and different line, uh, loan types can also impact the loan production cost differences. For instance, um, we also note that production of government loans tend to be a little bit more expensive than the production of conventional loans. Um, one other thing and last thing I want to note on the slide that um, this sample of 203 lend lending institution that we're covering here consists mostly of independent mortgage banks. Um, they're one alliance and we do believe that uh, it is a more clear, more accurate picture of what the production cost will look like in a given time period. All right, let's move on to our next slide. Um, based on our prior studies, we learned that more digitally mature organization and those that uh, maximize integration of digital and automated tools into their operation tend to be more cost efficient. Um, to better understand how Freddie Mac's LPA loan product advisor digital offerings can benefit lenders in today's environment, we compare the performance of, uh, once again, retail only lenders that deliver loans to Freddie Mac in third quarter of 2023 and leverage Freddie Mac loan production advisor technology tool offerings at a different rates. 
higher rate take rate versus the low take rate. What we are showing here are the lenders who use our digital offerings at a high rate in this chart, uh, defined as those who leverage partner solutions, a combination of AIM, A's, collateral for the 75% of all the volume sold to Freddie Mac versus those lenders with low usage of digital offerings, low take rate. Those who leverage ready technology offerings for less than 60% of all the volume sold to Freddie. Our analysis show, consistent with our prior findings, that lenders who leverage LPA offerings at a high rate tend to be more efficient. An average origination cost per loan for lenders with higher take rate was 14% or 1500 less than for lenders with lower take rate. Um, an average lender with high usage of technology offerings generated on average positive net margin and operated profit, unlike an average lender with low usage of technology offerings. Um, the other component of, of it is, of course, the cycle time. High digital tool user, users had five days shorter load production cycle time. What it means is that they spent 15% less time originating a loan compared to lenders with a lower usage of technology offering. One other point to make here on this slide, there's always another point to make, but on, the point I want to make on this slide uh, is in our prior study, we also found that lenders that leverage LPA offerings at a higher rate uh, tend to have 40% less loan defects compared to lenders with low use of, uh, use of technology offerings. And loan defects, as you all know, can be very pricey. Next slide, please. We have so far talked um, focused on total cost per loan uh, impact across the market and lender categories. But remember, each phase of the loan origination process for a pre-qualification of loan to loan delivery contains tangible components that influence costs. To help identify specific savings and opportunities um, across individual income statement line items, we all delve in, in a little bit further into specific uh, revenue and expense line items, but and we, what we also did, we evaluated uh, the impact of those savings uh, by each offering, such as, uh, as you can see here, ACE, AIM, and so on the chart um, that, um, that you see in front of you. One of the cost savings LPA digital offering deliver is linked to personnel expense. Um, and uh, based on our latest estimate, personnel expense represent two thirds, 67% of lenders total production costs, showing just how labor intensive this process can be. Um, leveraging lender mortgage industry compensation data and loan operations data, we estimate a lender can eliminate an average a minimum of two hours and a maximum of 12 hours of production time by leveraging LPA digital offerings when performing processing, underwriting, QC, or closing. As you can see in the exhibit in front of you, the personnel cost savings impact can vary across each digital offering, ranging between $165 and $388 per loan with much of those savings driven by the reduction in underwriting labor costs. Additionally, uh, effective use of technology tools can help lenders uh, process loans faster. In turn, and it can in turn reduce the cost of hatching and carrying funds. Based on our latest annual assessment of mortgage cycle time, Freddie Mac digital offering can produce between one to eight days in savings in closing cycle time, which translates into cost savings of up to $190 per loan. And the savings can be even greater with the right technology strategy that focuses on, of course, the optimization um, and maximization of available tools. Next slide, please. Beside cost savings, the use of LPA technology and tool offerings also drives higher pull-through rates because of faster closings, as we just noted, uh, client delight, that often translates into more referrals, 
and a reduction in revenue loss associated with repurchases and recourses if you have a higher share of the defects. We estimate that the incremental increase in pull through rate is about 1.3%, which can be translated into additional revenue of nearly $6 million per year for an average size lender. The benefits can vary by lender size, as we're showing in this slide. You see that the large lender can gain up to 21 million incremental revenue per year, where a small lender can increase its revenue almost as high as 1 million a year. A lender can capture higher benefits on collateral and automated collateral evaluation or ACE due to shorter cycle time. Uh, while majority of asset and income modeler, or in other words, A, benefits come from fewer recourses and repurchases. Before I close this section and pass the reins to Jody, who will talk and walk us through the specific digital strategies to reduce costs, I just wanted to leave you with two final thoughts or findings from our recent study. First, most lenders we interviews recognize automation is the path forward. The question is no longer whether lenders are adopting digital tools into their process, but how they can do it in the most effective manner to maximize results while not overspending because the costs definitely affect their in today's environment. Our research shows shows maximized benefits can be realized through optimization, digital tools, adoption, and integration and usage. And the second thing that I want to note, a well-executed implementation strategy, which Jody will speak on in the next section, is the one that can successfully engage staff, customers, and technology partners, and should help maximize operational and financial impact of digitization. Jody, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Yana. Uh, so I'll take it from here, and thanks for going through all the numbers and the study. I'll share a little bit about what we see in terms of seller success stories or lender success stories and how they've actually achieved those numbers and what they've done to make that happen. I'll give you some tips on maybe how to get started or how to improve your digital journey. And lastly, we'll cover some trends in the industry and things we see there emerging, such as uh, some AI and digital underwriting. So we'll talk about that toward the end. Um, I think, uh, Cindy noted, you're welcome to put your questions in Q&A along the way, and we'll pick those up at the end. Um, so let's start with the first key to success that we see. Um, the lenders that really achieve these numbers really think about that it's an end-to-end -end digital journey. It's not that we ask for, say, an asset report up front, and then a few minutes later, we ask them to do payroll, and then we ask them to maybe do their tax transcripts, or a week later, we come back and ask them for something else. It's really about setting that expectation with the borrower at the very beginning of the process. And what, what I see is successful lenders say um, that this digital strategy really is kind of our secret sauce and our benefits. It's not a barrier to working with the borrowers. And I think it, it does take some mindset shift to get there. Um, but we are seeing a lot more the activity in the consumer space where they're really expecting that lenders are taking the friction out of this process and they're making it easier. And they're really thinking about um, just how can I do things myself? So what does that end-to-end -end digital journey look like? Well, it looks like that you're they're doing their online shopping probably without the assistance of every, anyone. Um, they're completing their loan application usually by themselves on a website. They are opting in to assets um, with their bank accounts and hopefully their payroll solutions as well. We're seeing a lot more activity with some credentialed solutions there. Uh, and then they're moving on from that into e-disclosures. Um, we're seeing a whole different spectrum of appraisal options, not just ACE, but ACE and the PDR and some other options there that really help remove friction and concern from the, the borrower up front so they can uh, really know that they have a, a solid approval at the beginning. Um, but it's also helping them understand that these same things they did up front, we're going to use in the closing process. So leveraging those asset reports again to do the 10 day employment documentation and streamlining that, or maybe refreshing payroll information. And then lastly, that e-closing solution or a, um, at least a hybrid option. So I know that in a lot of cases, these 
solutions are all on different tech stacks. And it's not just like obvious to the borrower where they should go or they don't understand that they got an email or something else. So a couple of things I see as successful strategies is lenders will put out videos saying, hey, here's our digital process. Welcome to our digital process. And here's how this works and what you're going to see along the way. Or maybe they send out short videos along the way during the process to keep the borrower engaged and to know what's coming. Um, minimally, they do some sort of a marketing or some sort of uh, piece that their loan officers can share with borrowers to say this is the digital experience and this is what we expect. So you're not putting the burden on the loan officer to keep asking for something different than what they're usually doing. You're really selling this as a digital journey and a digital experience. Um, Cindy, let's head to the next one. The next thing that I see is that lenders really maximize their technology investment. So Yana, thanks for the metric about going from 2% to 4% of tech spend. You know, while that might sound like a lot, uh, in, it might be a great investment. It should be, right? And that's what we see in the lenders that are doing this well. They're not just shelling out the money for the technology or paying per click or paying per loan. That gets quite expensive. They're making sure that they're really getting the value out of the money that they spend. And that's really not just about um, buying the technology and putting it out there. It's really being mindful about the process, the providers and your people. So on the process side, really thinking through how things work today and how they should work. Uh, and then secondly, they experiment the change with a small team. So they'll have a little pilot group that works through it all, that works through things manually, that figures out how the technology should work, and they'll get all the kinks out of it before it scales to a larger part of the company. The other thing I see is that that small team really becomes kind of the evangelists where they're able to then help convince their peers that this does work and they have metrics coming out of these little experiments to also show that it is successful. And by the way, if it's not successful, uh, hopefully they also stop, right? And reinvent and do something different. So I think that's a, a great way to think through your process and to, to test it out before you scale. The other thing I see them do is really be um, just, uh, almost ruthless in their provider selection. So they're constantly reviewing their service providers, they're monitoring that market, they um, swap partners in and out in some cases, and they, they really scrutinize their spend. Uh, that doesn't mean that they spend the same on every loan either. Uh, along with this means, you know, picking the right loans and the right borrowers for where you might maximize your investment in the digital technology. So just something to, to think about there that not, not all loans are, are equal and it, it certainly may make sense to spend um, the digital dollars on some more than others. And the last one is really thinking about your people. Um, as the study noted that two thirds of lenders production costs come from people. And while part of digital transformation is perhaps to reduce some of the, um, the that cost in that area, a lot of it involves taking your people and thinking about how they can work differently in a digital environment and how can you put the right folks on the right loans at the right time. So uh, a key to that is really thinking about what are you measuring in this digital process? How are you monitoring for your success? If you're just putting something out there and, they're, and you're not paying attention, um, you can just really spend a lot of money without understanding the results you get. So I see successful sellers really having they call keep KPIs here or key performance indicators where you're monitoring maybe by branch or by loan officer who's successful and who's not. And you're digging into the details when they're um, not successful or not keeping up. And then you're kind of tracking those loans all the way through. And we have some metrics on our reporting tools as well through ECO that can help you track as a lender your days that you're saving and, um, and perhaps a little bit of uh, uh, cost savings as well with some of these loans. So really just kind of paying attention to um, are you really getting what you want? The other two is really around change management. So educating people is key. Uh, your loan officers, your borrowers, everybody along the way, really getting that shift in mindset across so everybody buys in and recognizing that uh, change is hard, um, but they have to all be able to see kind of how they fit into the process. Uh, and then the last piece I see in a lot of sellers is they are actually um, incenting the behavior that they want to see. In some cases, maybe that's in sending the borrower. In a lot of cases, it's the loan officer or the processor. And you know, just really thinking about how do you encourage people? There's some, you know, like funny contests that I've seen uh, along the way just to uh, help promote who's being successful and to encourage people to share their success stories rather than uh, where they're stuck. Uh, all right, Cindy, let's head to the next one. 
So that's some of the, the ways we see lenders be successful. Uh, if you're getting started on this journey, or maybe you're already started and you're stuck, uh, here's, I guess, I'll, we'll look at three ways that you can either get started or improve. So the first one is really thinking about how you can be um, more efficient in this new normal for digital process. So start at the very beginning, really thinking about that application process. And for one, making sure that all of your borrowers align, apply online with um, digital verification as the new normal. Uh, I know it can be tempting to do things for them, but uh, really in this industry at this point, pretty much people apply online and enter their own stuff. As you're setting up that digital application experience, making sure that the borrowers have to opt out of the digital process rather than opting in will get you a long way toward um, just making this part of their normal routine. If you have to ask them if they want to, it is really easy to answer no. If it's just part of their process, it'll just magically happen. But with all of that, then uh, that does mean that your loan officers change. So they're, they're going to have to think about their role a little bit different too in a digital space. So um, really thinking for them about that they're working toward obtaining a solid assessment before the loan goes to underwriting. So they're not an order taker anymore. They're really coaching the borrower. They're working through things and they're, they're really making sure that everything is rock solid before it moves on. Uh, including what we see quite often is the use of some self-employment calculators and tools that are really upfront in the process to help the loan officer so they're not just sending everything over to underwriting. So when you think about this more holistically, you're really just moving all the work forward. Uh, you know, Yana, you mentioned saving two to 12 hours in the underwriting time. Well, how you do that is that you, you move the work to the front of the process. So if you're borrower is now able to do more things online for themselves and your loan officer is able to focus more on that getting that digital assessment right and getting everything um, square before the loan moves on you've just taken a lot of the back and forth out of your process and you've moved that work up front so you know just think about it that way as much as you can is how do you take work that's happening later moving it forward you know just like the airlines did and the grocery store did and everybody else the mortgage industry is, is really no different everything's really moving towards self-serve um, Cindy, let's head to the next one. The next piece is choosing data over documents. I know it's super tempting to just uh, have the borrower just bring their stack of stuff and send that in and that feels good and it feels safe, but honestly it's a lot faster if you populate the application with digital data and you don't require the borrower to type anything that can be digitally assessed. If you, if you can do that all up front, that'll really help you get the information right the first time and you won't have to keep rechecking and rechecking that over and over again. The, we do help a lot with that um, in terms of the messages that LPA gives you. There are some key things that you can follow along and just make sure that you're not asking for additional documentation if you don't need it. And I will say that's probably one of the biggest mistakes I see happen in lenders in this digital process is they both collect the documents up front and then they also do the verification reports. And Honestly, that you're you're wasting the borrower's time and your time, and now you create this reconciliation problem. So, to the extent that you can really focus on digital first, that is your best bet, and that will get things right at the beginning, and everything will just flow from there. Um, and then, lastly, I'll say, you know, if you haven't looked at some of the things in AIM for a little while, there's some new things that have come out. Uh, so, we've really expanded what we're doing with asset reports. You can now use them to turn cautions into accepts for borrowers with great cash flow or good rental history. So that is a, a big reason why you might want to pull an asset report for not just an asset report. We're using it to calculate income. So we can look at direct deposit data for non-wage income and wage income and help you reduce some documentation there. And everybody will see that if you send an asset report, the messages um, already come back. There's nothing that you have to do special. It, it just happens. And then the other magic piece with that is with an asset report, you'll get a message for 10-day PCV that says if you close by this date, um, your asset report can serve as that documentation. So you won't have to do the 10-day um, the verbal VOE and that saves you some time too. So that's something that I think that that power of that asset report has really grown in the years since it's rolled out. So that would be another tip to think about in terms of choosing data. And then lastly, we're venturing into pay stub and W2 OCR. So when you do have the documents, there's a, um, a way to potentially use them for digital assessment. So that's another one. And then lastly, as somewhere else to go, is really to scrutinize your process. So really getting back to just rethinking your operations. Um, so 
digital solutions really should help you eliminate redundancy in your process. It should help you get things right the first time so you don't have to keep repeating the same activity all the way through. And we already talked about duplicate and conflicting documentation, so try to keep away from that. The other piece I'll mention is uh, really thinking about then the right resources to work the right loans. And we used to talk about right loans. You'll see, uh, we'll talk a little bit about right tasks coming up, but really being smart about putting your best resources on the hardest loans is a, is a great opportunity to recognize some of those efficiencies. Um, and then lastly, just think about your processes. All loans aren't the same. So what you might do for a pre-approval might be different than what you do for a refi application and a purchase refinance or a purchase application. And just really thinking about how might you adjust your process for that. Uh, all right, so let's head, Cindy, I think, to the digital trends. All right, these are fun topics for me. And we just see so much happening in the industry and a lot of change coming. Things that have been talked about for years are finally really, I think, showing up. Um, and, and really happening. And uh, I think, Yana, you talked about really how much has changed financially for lenders. Um, and so the last couple of years, um, people have really, I think, taken some time to regroup, but now we're really seeing that investment start to pick up, specifically in three areas. Uh, AI in, has been in the news a lot lately. We're seeing AI help fill out loan applications. We're seeing it help with OCR of data from documents or putting documents in the right buckets. We're seeing it um, being used to answer questions about procedures or guidelines or even HR stuff. Um, we're finding that uh, perhaps it's being used for getting leads uh, or QC and alerts. So those are some themes that we're seeing in the AI space that's really starting to come alive just in the last year or so. The, the second piece we're seeing as a trend is digital underwriting. And that is, uh, you think of things like um, Gateless or Candor or the ICE analyzers, really being able to take a whole loan into um, consideration and then check off all of the things that an underwriter would normally check off. Um, we're seeing that technology mature and lenders really thinking about that as a way to potentially scale when volume picks back up, I think is a, um, an, oppor an opportunity we're seeing show up more in the market. And then the last one that's been a big topic this year, although it's been around for a super long time, I am seeing task-based workflow really show up in a lot of conversations right now where lenders are looking at their process, they're figuring out how to split it into tasks. Uh, and as I had mentioned, not just assigning the right loan to the right person, but really splitting up the work and getting the work going uh, in parallel and to the, to the right people. Um, so that is something that we're seeing emerge in a lot of LOS and POS solutions. Um, but that does require uh, a bit more dissection of your process and setting things up. So those are my three things. And uh, let's talk a little bit about summary, Cindy, if you want to flip to the last page. So uh, probably the biggest advice I could give you is thinking about digital success really starting at the top and having a great strategy and a mindset. Uh, that is probably the number one thing. Not so much which technology provider you pick or how you use it because those will change over time, but it's really about having that mindset at a company that this is how we work and how we're gonna be. Um, it really can help you reduce your documentation burden. I think that one's fairly obvious. Uh, you will end up with more reprimand relief and that'll feed into the quality savings that Yana talked about earlier. Uh, as well as those revenue gains. And the ultimate goal of this really is a borrower experience. So giving them really the things that we're asking for. So take all these kind of things together and leverage some of the Freddie Mac technology that's out there. And I think we all can really end up helping the industry lower that cost to originate that Yana started with earlier today. So uh, that is the, the end of the pieces that I have. Uh, Cindy, I'm going to shift it back to you if you want to take over with some survey questions and some Q&A. Great, thank you very much, both, um, all of you. Now, while I'm opening the Q&A, hold on one moment. Um, so we do, actually, we do have a poll that uh, should appear on your screen now, if, if the, we have five minutes to respond. As you're responding, um, one question that we had is um, about slide 10, Yana. Um, someone had uh, asked, um, how does Freddie def define the size of a lender, the small, medium, large? Um, Absolutely. For this particular study, what we've done is we've uh, looked at the 
quarterly volume uh, produced by individual institutions. And we said that a lender would be defined as large size institution if they uh, originate um, volume that are greater than 500 million. And the medium size would be between 150 million and 500. Keep in mind, these are quarterly, right? And of course, the small would be uh, anything below 150 million. Okay, great. And uh, if you are interested uh, in the paper that the link to which we will post, uh, there's also additional information related to the definition, the strategy, sorry, and the uh, methodology. Thank you. Uh, now we also have a question from Sanjeev. He notes the slide shows ACE and AIM cost savings is less than AIM savings, or am I misinterpreting it? Uh, not the cost. The cost actually greater for ACE and AIM, if you look at this, but the revenue piece, yes. Uh, so based on the model that we've developed or the, uh, the, the methodology that we've developed, what we have done is we've looked at uh, one of the components of the revenue pieces um, is, of course, uh, client delight. So the highest client delight that we are seeing um, would be associated with the aim, right? Just simply because, and I'm sure Joni can speak to it in more detail than I, but uh, the, you know, repeated uh, ask of for income, the documents and, uh, you know, employment, that's causing a lot of irritation for many borrowers. And I would think people write papers on this particular topic at this point. Yeah. So in this particular instance, what we have calculated is essentially an average between a client delight associated with using AIMS and AIM. So it's sort of a combined factor where in AIM only, you're just looking at that pure satisfaction level from not asking again your borrowers for additional documentation related to income and asset and employment. Hopefully yes, I think I think Yana, the number one customer dissatisfier was repeatedly asking for documents. Yes, it's way higher than the ACE one. Yes, the than anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, exactly. and I don't think they understand about appraisals and appraisal waivers and in a right. lot of cases, but they do understand about um, you lost my this or that. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and one other question, William asked, do personnel expenses include LO compensation as well as operational costs? Uh, absolutely. So uh, we actually interesting. We get this question a lot. Uh, a lot of lenders reaching back out to us and asking the specific question. Yes. So the uh, payroll or personnel expense includes uh, uh, anything that is related to the compensation related expense that will include the LO compensation. Okay. Great. Um, let me see. I'm going through my list. My apologies. Um, okay. A few active folks have asked, is it possible to get a copy of this PowerPoint after the presentation? And yes, it will be, the PowerPoint will be sent out. Um, next question, uh, does a company need to opt in for AIM with Freddie or is it automatic? It's automatic. So you will need to sign up with a provider, one or more of those, and you will need to send in, in most cases, the report ID. So when you pull it, uh, include that in your LPA submission, but um, it, it is available to everyone. We would like the most people to use it as possible. So there is a, we try to reduce that, that barrier really to getting started. Uh, if you need help, certainly contact your Freddie team and we're here to help you um, get started on that journey. Great, and actually, uh, Yana, could you tell us what ACE stands for? Jody. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I can. Automated okay. collateral evaluation. So it's right. uh, taking a look at the property and it's assessing it for um, value and making sure that the the value is consistent um, with what we see. And then it will um, basically offer you um, either no appraisal or a, perhaps some other range of options. You might get an option to not do a full appraisal, but to do a property data report, for example. So, um, so really that, that whole collateral spectrum is opening up to really um, remove friction from the process where we can. One item I want to add to Jody's response, I think uh, you find it in our study. We found that um, you know a base can also save six hundred dollars for uh, for your borrowers as well, simply because they don't need collateral. Right. Actually, Yana, that that make 
Yes, and that makes me think about something. One of the being a digital seller, one of the great things I think is just a great place to start is if you have an ace on a loan, then shoot for getting the the full enchilada there. Like make sure you're going after the asset report and the payroll report because that is all money well spent because those are the loans that are going to close fast and you're going to have great borrower satisfaction. So if you did nothing else as a lender other than saying for every ace loan, I'm going to turn them into a digital experience, I think I think people would really see some great success in that space and those would be you know kind of that trifecta to really move things along and you'd have pleasant borrowers and um you'd have happy underwriters and happy loan officers all the way through so that would be a tip i think for where to start Great. Um, as i move to our question slide uh, we have another question from eric what advice do you have for convincing organizations to leverage cloud technology that many in the industry are hesitant to move, yet it is usually needed for AI? Yeah, that's probably a little bit beyond my skis, but uh, um, I think you are right. That is certainly an emerging industry trend. I think you're going to see in a lot of cases the tech partners that you work with are moving there for you. Um, so that might be a way to think about it is thinking about the trends that you're already seeing in your in your partners with larger organizations and um, how do you make that transition? Yeah, and if I could add to that, I think yeah. um, uh, when we conducted our survey as part of this research, we also saw a lot of institution are planning, if not already, um, to implement that particular technology. And so it's definitely one of the hottest trends, and a lot of folks find that the the data accuracy, the span is worse for them. Awesome, thanks. Um, we do have one comment. Um, it says, AIM is awesome with a smile face. <laughs> <laughs> AIM is awesome. Thank yes. you for that. <laughs> Glad to share that with everyone. Um, how can we get more details or a demo of LPA? Uh, so 1-800-FREDDY can help. Um, and so I would say if you have an account team you're already working with, contact them. That That's a great place to start. But uh, otherwise, the 1-800-FREDDY line can certainly help you with that. Uh, and if you want to leave your contact information in the chat, we can make sure somebody follows up with you as well. Okay. Um, and as I am scrolling, a number of folks have put questions in the chat. Um, what are QC requirements for the PDR and how are lenders managing that? Mm, that's probably more detailed than we'll get into here. But uh, again, if you want to leave your company name, we can make sure somebody follows up with you specifically on that one. Okay, great. Um, let me take a look and see. Um, I see one on self-employed borrowers. I'll answer that as it's coming in. Oh, okay. uh, I think we are seeing a lot more shift into the self-employed space like that is just an emerging trend where you're seeing uh, more borrowers in that bucket. There are a number of providers that we work with in the AIM space. And you're welcome to go out on the AIM page and, and see what they are. Um, they vary, you know, some of them are really, uh, you know, you take the, you take the, um, the OCR'd images or whatever of the tax data, and that goes through a partner and they automate those calculations for you. Some of them have a human in the loop where the human is doing that work and then giving you some calculations back. And then the other place we've been working with is Halcyon in the tax transcripts pace space with pulling that data direct from the IRS and then doing calculations um, directly off the data. So um, that is probably the one area that generates a lot of QC headaches and so to the extent that you can leverage some of those tools and um, put them I'll also say upfront in the process the lenders I see do really well with that they have the loan officers actually using the self-employed tools so it is helping them really work with the borrower at the very beginning of the process getting all the pages they need and all the returns they need and then um, helping to eliminate errors particularly in those complicated cases where there's multiple businesses or multiple rental properties okay great um, and I'm not sure if this one might um, apply or not. Um, what is the percentile breakdown between LO cost and operations cost? Is that something you have to share? Uh, unfortunately, we're not making any of this information. I mean, uh, we, well, while we are able to see individual line items related to a staff, we can't get down to that particular level. The information that we are capturing is essentially a reported income statement breakout line items. Um, so, unfortunately, that is not uh, the breakout that we have handy at this point. Okay, great. 
And um, I actually, in the chat, I am going to put a link to the AIM providers. Hopefully all have seen that. Oh, thank you, Cindy. Um, and I'm looking to see, are there any other questions that have come up? I am not seeing any additional questions. Um, while uh, we are going through, we'll wait another moment. Um, but what I can do is go to our next slide and just provide some resources. I will wait another moment just to see if there are any other questions coming in. Um, but we do have some resources on our research tools and digital capabilities and training. Yeah, and that that uh, kind of back to the other person's question on LPA, like that's a good link to start with. Um, there's some self-guided videos and some things there you can do on your own. Our training group also has a really nice um, online, or I'll say attendee webinar on how to read the LPA feedback certificates. So that would be another maybe good place to start. Okay, great. And so I don't see any additional questions. Um, I would like to thank uh, Jody and Yana both for for your expertise and and um, filling everyone with information. And as we have said before, uh, the PowerPoint will be sent out. Um, after, after this event. And if you have any additional questions, please feel, to e feel free to email us. Uh, you will get the copy of the deck and a survey will be sent to you right after this. So if you could complete that so we can get an idea of what future topics and how this was, we would appreciate it. So thank you all. We appreciate it and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.